Hello, everyone, and welcome to another video on our own devices. I'm Jean Messier, and today we are concluding our three part series on the history of Polaroid instant cameras. So far in episodes one and two, we've had a look at some of the major milestones in the development of instant photography, from the first instant camera, the Model 95, introduced in 1948, to color pack film, introduced in 1963 to the first affordable consumer-grade instant camera, the Model 20 Swinger, launched in 1965. But all these developments fell far short of Polaroid founder Edwin Land's ultimate vision for instant photography, which was to remove as many barriers as possible between photographer and subject in order to turn photography into a natural and intuitive creative act. In all of these cameras that we looked at so far, you had to manually extract film you had to wait a certain amount of time for the development process to finish and then peel apart the film to reveal the finished image, risking getting caustic developing chemicals all over your hands or clothes. However, at a Polaroid annual meeting on April 25th, 1972, Edwin Land strode on stage, pulled out a brand new camera from his pocket, and announced, after today, photography will never be the same. He then proceeded to take five photos in 10 seconds, all of which were automatically ejected from the camera and developed on their own without any further input from the user. That camera was the iconic SX-70, and it introduced the revolutionary new technology of integral film which is what most of us think of when we think of Polaroid and instant photography as a whole. Now, the chemistry behind integral film is very impressive. So let's actually have a closer look at how this works. So the emulsion stack inside integral film is effectively identical to that in the earlier pack film. So you have three layers of silver halide emulsion sensitized to red, green, and blue light, respectively. And behind each emulsion layer is a layer of dye in the corresponding complementary color, cyan, magenta, and yellow. Behind this is a black polyester layer that serves as the backing for the photograph. And on top is the receiving layer onto which the dyes will be deposited. Above this is a layer of plastic known as the timing layer, followed by a layer of acidic plastic. And this entire sandwich is sealed behind a sheet of transparent mylar held in a plastic frame, the thicker bottom edge of which holds the pod of developing chemicals, which include potassium hydroxide and white titanium dioxide pigment. Now, as soon as the film is exposed, it is automatically ejected from the camera through a pair of motorized rollers, which pops the reagent packet and spreads the chemicals in between the emulsion stack and the receiving layer. So the development, diffusion, and deposition process within the emulsion stack carries on much as it did in the earlier pack film. And if you want to learn more about that, please check out the previous video in this series. The difference with integral film is how that process is protected from light, how it is timed, and how the final image is revealed. And this is where those two extra chemicals and those two extra layers in the stack that I mentioned before come into play. So that white titanium dioxide pigment in the reagent pack acts as a screen or curtain protecting the developing emulsion layers from light. And this accounts for that milky white or sometimes turquoise color of the film right when it comes out of the camera. Meanwhile, that potassium hydroxide is slowly eating its way through the timing layer. And when it finally breaks through, it's going to hit that acidic plastic layer and become neutralized. And this brings the development reaction to a halt. It acts as a stop bath. Also, that change in pH causes that screen of titanium dioxide pigment to go from milky white to transparent, causing the developed image to be revealed. And that is the insane and rather magical chemistry behind integral film. Now, something worth noting here is that no matter what outcast might claim, there is actually no reason to shake a Polaroid integral picture. If everything is sealed inside this Mylar envelope away from the air, so you're not drying anything or accelerating the development reaction by shaking. Indeed, this might actually damage the photograph because it might bend the envelope and cause the emulsion to smear before it has a chance to harden. And indeed, a lot of artists took advantage of this weird quirk by smearing and spreading around the emulsion while it developed to create these very painterly impressionistic images. And probably one of my favorite examples of this is the cover of Peter Gabriel's 1980 self-titled album, in which Gabriel himself 
smeared his own portrait to create the final effect. And by the way, if you haven't listened to that album, it is excellent, one of my very favorites. Now, the first camera designed to take integral film, the SX-70, was no less a technological wonder than the film itself. Uh, this was actually Polaroid's first single lens reflex or SLR camera, meaning that rather than having a separate viewfinder, the view through the lens was reflected up into the viewfinder, meaning that what you saw through the viewfinder is what you actually took a picture of. But at the same time, the whole camera was designed to fold up into a very compact package, and this required the development of some truly unique optics to make those two functions work together. So let's have a closer look at this camera and see how it works. The first thing you're going to notice about this camera is the absolutely lavish finish on it, which includes genuine top crane leather. And this was not common on consumer electronics even back in the early 70s, but it was something that Edwin Land absolutely insisted on. Also, while this might look like it's machined from solid metal, this is actually made of glass-filled polysulfone plastic with a chromium, copper, and nickel finish on it. But this is so well done that you'd be excused for thinking that this is actual metal. And also interesting about this camera is that this was one of the last projects that legendary industrial designer Henry Dreyfus worked on before he and his terminally ill wife tragically committed suicide in October 1972. Right, so one final note before we have a closer look at the workings of this camera is about the origins of the name SX-70. So this actually dates from the very earliest days of Polaroid and was originally the developmental codename for the Model 95 camera. Now, during the development of the SX-70, it was originally known as Aladdin. And just prior to its release, there were rumors that it might be called the Polaroid American or the Polaroid Nunc, which is Latin for now. However, at some point, this old code name was resurrected and just kind of stuck. Right, so let's finally have a closer look at this camera. Now, unfortunately, this is really tricky to take apart, and this particular example does not belong to me, so I'm not even going to try. Thankfully, however, there are a bunch of vintage illustrations and animations that I can use to show you the inner workings. Right, so the camera is currently in its folded configuration, and while this is certainly more compact than a lot of the cameras we've looked at so far, I wouldn't exactly call this pocket-sized. And Indeed, legend has it that Edwin Land, showman that he was, had specially tailored suits made with larger pockets that he could whip out the SX-70 in demonstrations. Now to open this, you simply pull up on the viewfinder hood and the whole camera unfolds like that. And then to fold it back up, you press back on this strut and it collapses down. And what you'll notice is that this has very few controls compared to other cameras that we've looked at. And this was part of Edwin Land's vision of a camera that was extremely straightforward and intuitive to use. So all we have is a focusing knob on the right side of the lens, and the actual dial is on the lens bezel, and you'll see that goes from one foot out to infinity. On the left side of the lens, we have our lightning and darkening knob, but typically this was left in the central position because this had an automatic exposure system tied to this photoelectric cell or electric eye right below the dial, and that would automatically adjust the shutter speed up to 18 seconds based on ambient lighting conditions. And then finally, on the right-hand side of the lens, we have our shutter release button, which, unlike in other cameras we've looked at, is an electronic rather than a mechanical component. And that's it in terms of controls. The only other external features worth mentioning here are, of course, the viewfinder. We have a film counter at the back. And then on top of the lens, we have a socket for a Polaroid innovation known as the flash bar. And we've actually gone over this in my previous video on the history of camera flashes linked in the description. So this consists of a plastic holder for 10 flash bulbs, five on one side, five on the other. So that simply slots in like this. And once you've used the flash bulbs on one side, you simply pull the bar out, flip it around, and use up the other side. And the number 10 was chosen to correspond with the number of exposures in a pack of film. And this is what a film pack for the SX-70 looks like. And like I said, it contains 10 exposures as well as yet another Polaroid innovation, the 6-volt 4-cell Polapulse battery, which is to power the flash bar, the exposure system, and the rollers in the film ejection system. And this meant that so long as you had film, you could take a picture. You didn't need to have separate batteries that could run down. So to load the SX-70, you would push down on this little yellow button on the side and open the trap door at the front. You would then insert your film pack, close the door, 
and it would automatically spit out the cover sheet, which is what's protecting the film inside from direct exposure to light. You would then be ready to take your first photograph. Now, before a photograph is taken, the light from the scene travels through the four element glass lens and bounces off an angled mirror at the rear of the camera. This reflects the light onto something called a Fresnel reflector. Now, we've covered Fresnel lenses in a previous video, and the basic idea is that a lens of large curvature that would otherwise be too bulky or heavy to manufacture can be approximated using a series of concentric prismatic elements. And a Fresnel reflector works exactly the same way, only with reflective rather than refractive elements. And the Fresnel reflector is going to reflect that light back up to a different point on the mirror and then into a concave aspheric mirror in the viewfinder, which is going to produce a floating aerial image inside the viewfinder. So when you push the shutter release, this is going to power up a 12,000 RPM electric motor that is going to turn only seven revolutions to unlock a latch that is going to cause the Fresnel reflector to flip back against the rear mirror. Now, just as an aside, Polaroid looked all over the place for the right motor that would meet their compactness, power consumption, and speed requirements. And what they eventually found was that the motors used to drive HO scale model trains were ideal, and this is what they used going forward. Now, as the Fresnel reflector flips back, it is going to expose a second mirror identical to the mirror behind it on its lower surface. And at the same time, the shutter is going to open. Now the light from the scene is going to go through the lens, reflect off that mirror, but instead of being reflected up into the viewfinder, it is going to be reflected down onto the first exposure in the film pack on the bottom of the camera. Now the shutter is going to stay open for as long as the exposure system mandates, and then once it closes, the film is going to be automatically ejected through those rollers and out of the camera starting the development process. And then the Fresnel reflector flips back down, and the whole process is ready to start again. And that entire sequence of events from beginning to end takes only about one and a half seconds. Now this particular example of the SX-70 comes with its original carrying case along with a number of really neat accessories. For example, this is a macro lens for taking close-up pictures and the holder for the lens slots into the socket for the flash bar and then the lens slides into these two rails. And telephoto lenses of the same design were also available for the SX-70. This is a bracket for mounting the camera on a tripod, which just clips on the bottom and has a standard quarter 20 threaded hole at the bottom. This is a remote shutter release for taking long exposure photos, which plugs into this socket on the right hand side of the camera. And finally, this is a neat mechanical self timer switch, which instead of plugging into the same socket as the remote release, actually clips over the regular shutter release button. So you then wind up the dial to set your delay, you hit the red button, and after the chosen delay time, a little finger pops out and physically presses the shutter release button. But perhaps even more impressive than the actual technology that went into the SX-70 was the tremendous amount of resources and money and time that was poured into making this camera possible. As one of you commented on a previous video in this series, uh, Edwin Land was really the Walt Disney of the photography world. He and his company were willing to pour tremendous resources into these wild and ambitious projects based on little more than his own personal intuition and whim. And his personal maxim was, don't undertake a project unless it is manifestly important and nearly impossible. And the SX-70 is perhaps the greatest manifestation of that ethos. This cost hundreds of millions of dollars to develop and some of the technologies required to make it work were so new that they didn't even exist yet when construction began on the camera and film manufacturing facilities. Yet, while this was a groundbreaking piece of technology, it wasn't without its teething problems. For example, the very first Polypulse batteries were found to have degraded severely between being manufactured and reaching the consumer, meaning that they were almost useless. They also tended to give off fumes that would cause the film to fog. But one of the biggest issues with the early SX-70s was with the viewfinder. So Edwin Land had absolutely insisted that there be no aiming reticle or rangefinder capability or anything like that in the viewfinder. He wanted the user to believe they were looking at the actual scene. And so when it came to focusing, the idea was that the user would be able to tell whether the scene was in focus or not. 
And Len described the focusing process as the image coming out of a fog, almost as the developing image came out of a fog. But unfortunately, in practice, because the image was so small, it was very difficult to tell whether the image was in focus or not. Even worse, the focusing system was directly tied to the exposure system, meaning that in many cases, the photo would come out not only blurry, but also over or underexposed. Now, eventually, Land was persuaded, rather grudgingly, to accept the introduction of a split circle rangefinder in the viewfinder. However, he insisted that it be placed in the corner of the viewfinder so that it wouldn't be too distracting. But this caused another problem, which is that most people tended to use that circle as an aiming reticle, leading to a lot of cutoff heads and other photo composition mistakes. Ultimately, however, the SX-70's greatest flaw turned out to be its price, $180, nearly $1,300 today. Now, Polaroid hoped to launch the SX-70 in time for the 1972 Christmas season, but they weren't able to ramp up their production in time. So instead, they released the camera on a limited basis in Florida so that holiday goers could try out the camera and generate buzz, and then finally released the camera nationwide in early 1973. However, by 1974, despite having predicted sales in the millions, Polaroid only managed to sell 415,000 SX-70s, and as a result, their stock price dropped some 90%. Now, part of the problem here was that the launch of the SX-70 coincided with a period of very high inflation that dissuaded a lot of consumers from investing in expensive gadgets like the SX-70. But Whatever the ultimate cause, Polaroid was quickly forced to produce cheaper versions of the SX-70, including 1972's Model 2, which ditched the chrome fiberglass and top grain leather for white plastic and vinyl and sold for $149.95, and 1975's Model 3, which ditched the SLR mechanism for a simpler viewfinder and sold for $99.95. Then finally, in 1977, they simplified the design even further to produce what became an iconic camera in its own right, the Model 1000 One-Step. So this uses all of the same technology pioneered by the SX-70, but in a much simpler and cheaper to make package. So this has a non-folding injection molded plastic body. It is not an SLR. It has a separate and very simple viewfinder that doesn't even have an aiming reticle in it. It has a fixed focus plastic lens and only two controls. We have our lightning and darkening knob, just connected to an otherwise automatic exposure system, and then our shutter release on the right hand side. We also have a socket on the top for a flash bar and a film counter in the back. But otherwise, this shoots and loads exactly like an SX70. So to load this, you would push forward on this little slider, the front trapdoor opens, you would pop in your film pack close it, it would automatically eject the cover slip, and you'd be ready to take your picture. And retailing for only $39.95, around $140 today, the one step was the runaway success that the SX-70 never could be, becoming the smash hit of the 1977 holiday season. Nonetheless, Polaroid continued to produce ever more sophisticated variants of the original SX-70 design, Introducing advanced features like electronic flashes and an ultrasound-based autofocusing system they dubbed Sonar. The last two models in this series would be the SLR 680 and 690, which were introduced in 1982 and designed to use the newer, higher-speed 600 series film packs. Now, the late 1970s would prove to be a high watermark for Polaroid. In 1978, they sold some 14.3 million cameras and employed 21,000 people nationwide. And one of the reasons the company was able to stay dominant for so long in the field that they had pioneered was because Edwin Land had patented nearly every single aspect of the instant photography process, making it very difficult for competitors to develop their own instant cameras. Indeed, by the time Edwin Land died, he had some 535 patents to his name, making him third among American inventors to only Thomas Edison and Ellie Hugh Thompson. However, this didn't stop competitors from trying, and in the mid-1970s, Kodak started releasing its own series of instant cameras, including an absolutely hideous camera with an equally hideous name of the Handle, which featured a very goofy crank on the side that you had to turn to eject the film. And based on this and other infringements, 
In 1976, Polaroid sued Kodak for patent infringement. And while this trial would drag on for 10 years, ultimately the court sided with Polaroid, and Kodak was forced to pay out nearly $1 billion in damages. They were also forbidden to continue producing film for the cameras they had already sold, meaning that these products became worthless almost overnight. However, the late 1970s were also the beginning of the end for Polaroid, and one of the major factors in their long decline was the failure of Polavision, which was an instant home movie film system that the company released in 1977. And Polavision was really interesting because it used an additive color process very similar to something called Dufre color, which was developed all the way back in 1909. And this consisted of panchromatic black and white film that is sensitive to all colors equally, covered in something called a réseau, which is a color filter composed of a grid of very fine red, green, and blue lines. So when light shone through the filter onto the film, the different color components in the image would be filtered out and would differentially expose the film depending on how concentrated a particular color was in a particular region of the film. And then when the film was developed and the light was shone through it and the filter, the color image would be reassembled. But while Polavision was technically impressive, as a consumer product, it was fundamentally flawed. The film was contained on proprietary cartridges, which held only three minutes of footage, which could only be developed and played in a proprietary tabletop viewer. This meant that it was incompatible with existing 8mm home movie systems. Also, the presence of the réseau and the specifics of the instant developing process meant that the film was very insensitive to light and the color quality was very muddy. It didn't give a very good image. But worst of all, the release of Polavision coincided with the introduction of home video formats like Betamax and VHS, which soon rendered home movie systems as a whole obsolete. And while Polavision was eventually developed into the far more successful Polachrome format for making instant slide transparencies, the original system was taken off the market after only a few years. Now, as a result of the Polavision fiasco and a number of other commercial failures, in 1982, the Polaroid Board of Directors forced Edwin Land to step down as chairman. He would continue on with many of his non-commercial endeavors, such as serving on the President's Science Advisory Committee and founding the Roland Institute for Science at Harvard University, before passing away from natural causes in 1991. However, the full and fascinating life and career of Edwin Land is far beyond the scope of this video. Now, unfortunately for Polaroid, the departure of Land did little to change the company's flagging fortunes. One of the big problems that they faced at that time was the rise of one-hour photo development shops, which granted the average consumer an acceptably short turnaround time on photo developing while using much cheaper 35mm film cameras. But what ultimately did the company in was that it fell into the same success trap that would later doom its rival, Kodak. The company had made so much money and been so successful for so many years off of its flagship product that it failed to adequately diversify and change with the times. So for example, Polaroid was one of the very first companies to realize the potential of digital photography. However, rather than exploring the possibility of pure digital photography, of viewing images on screens, they spent tons of money trying to develop an ultra-compact photo printer that would replicate the experience of analog instant photography. So finally, in 2001, Polaroid filed for bankruptcy and all of its patents and trademarks were sold off. Now, the name Polaroid persisted under the auspices of the Petter Group, who used it as a brand name to sell generic electronics such as DVD players and televisions, but in 2008, the head of that company was charged with fraud and Polaroid went bankrupt once more. However, in that same year, an Austrian businessman named Florian Kapps launched the Impossible Project in which he acquired a defunct Polaroid film plant in Ischende in the Netherlands and used it to reverse engineer vintage Polaroid film formats and sell them to hobbyists who still had Polaroid cameras. And in 2017, the Impossible Project was purchased by the Polish investor Wacheslaw Smolakowski, renamed Polaroid Originals, and finally just Polaroid. And today, the resurrected Polaroid company continues to sell not only reproductions of vintage film formats, but also a line of consumer electronics, including digital cameras and photo printers.
And that is a brief history and technical overview of the rise and fall of Polaroid, one of the most innovative companies in the history of photography. Now, of course, Polaroid produced dozens of products between the launch of the SX-70 in 1972 and the company's ultimate demise in 2001. But I really wanted to just focus on the major milestones in the development of instant photography. But if I come across any of the cameras from this later period in Polaroid's history, I will definitely be covering those in their own individual videos on this channel. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. I hope that you enjoyed this entire series. And I will see you next time on yet another video where we'll look at more fascinating cameras and other devices just like these. Until then, I'm Jean Messier from Our Own Devices. Have a great day.